guys welcome back to another video lesson from Ross medical lectures in this lesson we are gonna be talking about the clostridium perforations and my name is Chania Ross Jacob before we begin if this is your first time in our channel and watching our video please subscribe to our channel below and make sure that you hit the bell notification so that you will be notified as soon as our new video lessons become available to you guys I really truly value your subscriptions likes comments that you guys leave the really go a long way to help support the channel and so for that i do really want to thank you guys the slides of this lecture are available to you guys in my instagram page rose medical lectures link of my insta page is given in the description box all right clostridium perforations the clostridium perforations are previously known as clostridium welchi i which is a gram positive rod shaped bacilli that is this bacteria take the purple color on gram staining and it's seen everywhere but most commonly in soil and in intestine of mammal these are capsulated and non motile bacteria the spores are subdominal and are rarely seen in culture media or material from pathogenic lesions that is it doesn't produce spores in tissues or in culture media especially the gas gangrene strains the species which cause the gas gangrene those species usually won't produce any spores in the tissues or in culture media so it can be identified by an aglo reaction we will discuss about this in later in the bio biochemical identification part and the spores are wider than the bacillary body which giving the bacillus a swollen appearance resembling the spindle so because of the spindle like appearance the name derived from the word colster k o l s t e r meaning spindle we know this bacteria is an obligate anaerobe so the endospores are able to survive long periods of exposure to air and other adverse environmental conditions clostridium perforations are responsible for food poisoning and gas gangrene we will discuss about this in detail in the clinical manifestation part next let's move on to the virulence factors these are mainly four major toxins and there are actually this bacteria have mainly four major toxins and eight minor toxins the major toxins are alpha beta epsilon and iota minor toxins are gamma delta lambda kappa theta eta mu and nu these toxins of clostridium perforations show varied bio biological activity it's given in the table just go through this once the alpha toxin is responsible for gas gangrene and myonecrosis in infected tissues the toxin possesses hemolytic activity and having lecithinase activity also which is a phospholipid c that act upon the lecithin and split the phospholipid lecithin alpha toxin is a lethal toxin and require calcium for its activity next to next toxin is beta toxin the beta toxin is one of the four major lethal toxins produced by this clostridium perforations it's lethal toxin necrotizing agent and trypsin labile that is this toxin that is the beta toxin is sensitive to trypsin which can completely inhibit the trypsin activity so that affect the digestion of proteins iota is the fourth major toxin which is a lethal toxin as well as a dermonecrotic iota is a binary toxin having two fragments fragment a which helps in adp ribosylation and fragment b which help in binding fragment a help in adp ribosylation and fragment b help in binding clostridium perforations has eight mi minor toxins other than these four major toxins biological activity of these eight minor toxins are given in this table just go through this once other toxins like neuraminidase and endotoxin are also produced by this bacteria to protect itself from the host defense mechanism based on the toxin produced by this bacteria it can be classified into a to e clostridium perforations type a clostridium perforations type b like that till clostridium perforations a to clostridium perforations type e among these only a and c 
that is the Clostridium perfringens type A and Clostridium perfringens type C cause diseases in human. Clostridium perfringens A which mainly produce alpha toxin is responsible for gas gangrene and food poisoning. Clostridium perfringens C is responsible for enteritis necroticans. An illness is caused by eating food contaminated with the large number of Clostridium perfringens bacteria that produce enough toxin in the intestine to cause illness. When we are discussing about the clinical manifestation, let's discuss it in three main headings. First one, Clostridial wound infection. Second one, Clostridial enteric infection. And other, Clostridial infection. Clostridial wound infection, Clostridial enteric infection and Clostridial other Clostridial infections. First, let's discuss about Clostridial wound infection. And McLennan has classified the Clostridial wound infection into three. Simple wound contamination, anaerobic cellulitis and anaerobic myositis or gas gangrene. First one, simple wound contamination. Second one, anaerobic cellulitis. Third one, anaerobic myositis or gas gangrene. Simple wound, simple wound contamination. It involves the wound surface contamination without the invasion or without invading into the underlying tissues. Next, anaerobic cellulitis. It involves the facial plane with minimal toxin release without muscle in invasion. Here, no muscle invasion, but here involves the facial plane with minimal toxin release. It is anaerobic cellulitis. You can see the uh, anaerobic clostridial cellulitis picture over here and third one is anaerobic myositis also known as gas gangrene here the muscle invasion occur we will discuss about the gas gangrene later in detail so it's about clostridial wound infection next clostridial enteric infection enteric means something related to intestine right there are mainly four clostridial enteric infections the first one food poisoning the food poisoning occur when we have improperly cooked food. About 10 raised to 8 viable vegetative bacilli are required to initiate the infection. Once this much, that is about 10 raised to 8 bacteria, enters, it releases enterotoxin and initiate the infection and form pores in the intestinal mucosal membrane. The food poisoning is caused by Clostridial perfringens type A. How we diagnose the food poisoning is if we, we know this bacteria produce enterotoxin, so we diagnose food poisoning by detecting the enterotoxin in feces by enzyme immunoassay. The second clinical manifestation which come under the clostridial enteric infection is enteric colitis, enteric necroticans or gas gangrene of the bowel or pig bell or dam brand. It's a life-threatening condition characterized by ischemic necrosis of the jejunum and gas in the tissue plane. Enteric necroticans is caused by Clostridium perfringens type C. And the third clinical manifestation which will come under the Clostridial enteric infection is the necrotizing enterocolitis. It, res it resembles the enteritis necroticans but associated with Clostridium perfringens type A. The wall of the intestine is invaded by the bacteria which cause the local infection and inflammation. The fourth one is gangrenous appendicitis. It's about the clostridial enteric infection. Next, uh, let's discuss about other clostridial infection. Bacteremia, that is the presence of bacteria in the blood. And the other one is skin and soft tissue infection which cause the necrotizing infection of the skin and soft tissues. Third one is infection of endometrium leading to toxic shock syndrome. Fourth one is meningitis and brain abscess. And the fifth one is panophthalmitis. Next, let's go in detail about gas gangrene, which is also known as malignant edema or clostridial myonecrosis. By definition, it is a rapidly spreading edematous myonecrosis occurring in association with severely crushed wounds contaminated with pathogenic clostridia, particularly with clostridium perfringens. That is, you can see edema here, myonecrosis here, that is the damage of muscle tissue and this condition is caused by Clostridium perfringens. When we think about the causes of this clinical manifestation, it is also a polymicrobial. 
that is more than one class radial species can cause this but still 60% of gas gangrene is due to clostridium perforans and 20 to 40% is due to clostridium novi and clostridium septicum when it is a diagram showing uh, the picture of a gas gangrene you can see over here and when we come to pathogenesis for the development of the gas gangrene it require an anaerobic environment first Firstly, it is because the Clostridium perforans is an obligate anaerobe, so it require anaerobic environment. Secondly, it require contamination of wound with Clostridia, but rarely spontaneous. That is sudden. Non-traumatized gas gangrene can occur in case of people with gastrointestinal patholo pathologies like uh, colonic malignancy. because of the gastrointestinal pathologies the bowel clostridia can invade into normal muscle through hematogenous route or or through blood we already discussed that improperly cooked food is a risk factor for clostridial infection we already discussed about the virulence factor of clostridial perforans let's see some virulence factor among them that mediates the gas gangrene once the clostridial perforans introduced into the body it proliferates and elaborate the exotoxins chiefly alpha toxin and theta toxin the alpha toxin is the principal virulence factor having both phospholipase c and sphingomyelinase activity the alpha toxin activates two substances the platelet adhesion molecule and neutrophil receptors so when it activate the platelet adhesion molecule and neutrophil receptors then what it gonna do is the platelet and neutrophil aggregate in the blood vessel causing occlusion the next one the alpha toxin the alpha toxin gonna do the what gonna do is it directly suppresses the myocardial contractility leading to reduction in the cardiac output and resulting in the profound profound hypotension result in the profound hypotension the next I already told you that 40 to 20 percentage of gas gangrene is produced by other clostridial species. That is the clostridial species other than the clostridial perforans. So clostridium septicum produces alpha toxin, beta toxin, gamma toxin, septicolysin, protease, and uraminidases. Whereas Clostridium novi has four subtypes: Clostridium novi type A to Clostridium novi type D. Among these four serotypes, the Clostridium novi type A produces bacteriophage coded alpha toxin, which is the common cause of gas gangrene. When we come to clinical manifestations of gas gangrene, the incubation period is variable depending upon the nature of injury and the amount of wound contamination and type of Clostridial species involved. If the gas gangrene is due to clostridial perforans the incubation period is 10 to 48 hours the manifestations include the sudden onset of excruciating pain at the affected site so there will be severe pain at the affected site which is sudden in onset and there will be rapid development of foul smelling thin sero sanguinous discharge that is a yellowish fluid with small amount of blood begin to leave from the wound We know when bacteria evade through the tissue, there will be necrosis. The name itself suggests the same, right? Clostridial myonecrosis, the necrosis of the muscle. So the bacteria starts to utilizing the carbohydrates present in the cell and starts to produce gas because they are fermenting carbohydrate from tissues, and these gases are foul smelling. The formation of the gas and tissue necrosis together known as gas gangrene. browny edema and interactions will be there such gangrenous tissues later become liquefied and sloughed off even the shock and organ failure can develop later the gas gangrene is associated with high mortality rate that is about 50% of mortality rate then come to it's about clinical manifestation then come to laboratory diagnosis actually laboratory diagnosis has role only for the confirmation of the clinical diagnosis that is to confirm that it is a gas gangrene and for the species identification so which specimen we will collect here you can take necrotic tissues muscle fragments exudate from deeper part of the wound a blood culture may be positive for both clostridial perforans and clostridial septicum 
swab rubbed over the wound surface or soaked in the exudates are not satisfactory note that it is not satisfactory so the specimen should be put into robertson's cooked meat broth and should transported immediately to the laboratory so now we collected the specimen and transported next we want to observe this under microscope so on gram staining the gram stained films provide the clues about the species of clostridia present absence of neutrophil in the infected tissue is a characteristic feature thick chubby gram positive bacilli without spore is a suggestive of clostridial perforations and spore bearing bacilli suggest other clostridia species so if it is a spore bearing gram positive bacilli with citron body it is a suggestive of clostridium septicum and if you can see a large rod with oval subterminal spores it is a suggestive of clostridium novi We already discussed that the Clostridium perforations can be identified as thick chubby gram positive bacilli without spores. Now the now the Clostridial perforations can be further identified by following methods. Here the culture plate should be incubated anaerobically at 37 degrees Celsius for 2 days. Now let's see the properties. First one is target hemolysis or double sound he hemolysis. It's nothing but on blood agar clostridium perforations produce an inner narrow zone of complete hemolysis due to theta toxin which is surrounded by a wider zone of incomplete hemolysis due to the alpha toxin. Let's repeat inner zone of complete hemolysis and which is surrounded by wider, wider zone of incomplete hemolysis. The second one you can see the uh, double zone of hemolysis over here in this diagram and Second one is Naglos reaction. In Naglos reaction, the clostridial perforations produce an opalescence surrounding the streak line on egg yolk agar. Not only the clostridial perforations, but also some other species which are having alpha toxins show positive for Naglos reaction. You can see the Naglos reaction diagram over here. See, and the third one is a uh, reverse camp test. Clostridium perforations is streaked over the center of the blood agar plate and streptococcal agalactia is streaked perpendicular to it. So the presence of enhanced sonohemolysis pointing towards the clostridial perforations indicate the reverse cam test is positive. Here you can see the diagram showing the reverse cam test. Here the presence of enhanced sonohemolysis pointing towards the clostridial perforations can be seen here. And the fourth one is heat tolerance test. The clostridial perforations can grow when RCM broth is incubated at 45 degrees Celsius for 4 to 6 hours. This differentiates the clostridial perforations from other organisms in the specimen. The fifth one is the litmus milk. The clostridial perforations produce stormy clot reaction due to the fermentation of the lactose. As a result of this, it produces a vigorous gas. It produces acid as well as vigorous gas. Next, let here you can see the diagram showing the stormy fermentation of the litmus milk. L next, let's see how we treat the gas gangrene. The most crucial step is early surgical debridement. Here, all the devitalized tissues means all the dead tissues with very low oxygen content should be widely resected so as to remove the condition that produce anaerobic environment. We know this bacteria can thrive in anaerobic environment. So we, sh we should resect that tissues to avoid the uh, anaerobic environment. Recommended antibiotics for gas gangrene is the combination of penicillin and clintomycin for 10 to 14 days. The hyperbaric oxygen therapy may kill the anaerobic clostridia such as clostridial perforations. However, in case of aerotolerant clostridia species like clostridium septicum, the hyperbaric oxygen therapy won't work. And the passive immunization is done with anti-alpha toxin antiserum. Next, let's see how we can prevent the clostridial infection. Vaccination against alpha toxin is protective in experimental animals against the gas gangrene, but it has not been investigated in human. So, it's about today's video. I hope it's helpful for you guys. If you have any doubt, feel free to comment. And if you like my video, uh, like it, 
comment and share and subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you will get notification whenever I am uploading new video. Thank you for watching.